Canada's opposition parties continue to threaten to topple the minority Conservative government and replace it with a coalition made up of the Liberals and New Democrats with the support of the Bloc Québécois. If the government were to be defeated, the Governor-General would have to decide either to call a new election or give the coalition a chance to govern. But Canada has had only one other coalition government in its history. As in 2008, the events leading to its creation were unpredictable, unparalleled, and unfamiliar. October 12, 1917, a new party is born. The Union government is formed. Prime Minister Robert Borden introduced Canadians to the new coalition government. It was made up of Conservatives, Liberals, Independents, and a Labour representative. One Ontario journalist wrote, the heart of Canada should be buoyant today. Another in Regina reported, the old Borden government is a thing of the past. Let the country greatly rejoice. One MP echoed the sentiments of many. It was time for a new party. Not everyone agreed. Die-hard Ontario Tories were bitterly opposed to the new government. Borden has dug his own grave, remarked one Conservative MP. The Globe wrote about an avalanche of protest from the Liberals. By 1917, the First World War had raged on for three years. Canada's losses were incomprehensible. 10,000 casualties at Vimy in one day. Canada was in desperate need to send more soldiers. For Borden, conscription was the only answer. In Quebec, people were outraged. It led to violent demonstrations. Quebec nationalist Bourassa voiced the opinion of many Quebec people. Canada had no business in a blatantly imperialistic European war. Borden hoped that a government consisting of Conservatives and Liberals would help overcome these deepening divisions. He needed a strong, united government to support conscription. In May of 1917, Borden proposed the idea of a coalition government to the Liberal leader Sir Wilfrid Laurier. He rejected the proposal. He was convinced that conscription would tear the country apart. Borden didn't give up his pursuit for a coalition. He began courting individual Liberals and Independents. During the summer of 1917, he held well-publicized coalition talks with some of the 26 English-speaking Liberals who had voted for conscription. They failed. The Liberals remained loyal to Laurier. One journalist recalled the surprise caused by Laurier's grip. With an election looming, Borden was fearful that the conscription issue would defeat him at the polls. He confided to his diary, Our first duty is to win at any cost the coming election, so that we may continue to do our part in winning the war and that Canada not be disgraced. After the coalition talks had folded in August, he introduced two acts in September. One was the Wartime Elections Act. It caused widespread controversy. The Morning Chronicle of Halifax called it a freak scheme used to corral votes to a discredited government. Laurier said it was a blot upon every instinct of justice, honesty, and fair play. The law gave the right to vote to the spouses, widows, mothers, sisters, and daughters of any persons, living or dead, who wore the uniform. It took the vote away from conscientious objectors, Mennonites and Dukabors, and recently naturalized citizens born in an enemy country. Tens of thousands of new Canadians living on the prairies were disenfranchised. The Liberals fought the measure. In Borden's memoirs, he refers to the opposition's fierce and protracted resistance. Even amidst this hostility, Borden continued to woo Western and Ontario Liberals to a coalition government. He told them and the rest of Canada it was the demands of the war that had forced him to reshape the electorate, not mere party considerations. English-speaking newspapers started to openly support Borden's attempt for a coalition government. One Toronto Star editorial asked, Why do not members of the House on both sides express the feelings of the country and disregard party politics? One liberal backbencher said, I think that my constituency would vote for conscription 
but I also think that both parties should be represented in the government which enforces it. The tide was turning. The slow trickle of liberals to the conservative side began. On October 12, 1917, Borden presented to Canada his new coalition government, the Union government. The cabinet was made up of 12 conservatives, 9 liberals, and 1 labor representative. It is a ministry of hope for Canada, wrote the Globe. It included liberal Hugh Guthrie. He sat in Laurier's caucus for 17 years as a backbencher. In Borden's union government, he served as solicitor general. Thomas Alexander Creer, who many regarded as the leader of the West, was appointed as the Minister of Agriculture. He had no experience as an elected official. Borden wanted to win over the Prairie Provinces. Borden was now convinced that his government would be re-elected and called an election for December 17, 1917. Laurier's liberals were left divided and crippled. It gave birth to one of the most bitter election campaigns in Canadian history. December 18, 1917. Canada Votes Union, the English-speaking provinces pile up a great majority, read the headlines. Borden's Unionist Party wins a large majority, 153 seats to 82 Liberal seats. In Quebec, they took three out of 65 seats. Quebec was passed to the Liberals for six decades. The Union government's primary mandate was the war effort. Conscription was enforced. November 11, 1918, the armistice was signed. The Great War ended, and to many it was the beginning of the end for the Union government. By the spring of 1919, Canadians were growing impatient of the Union government. French Canadians and many others of non-British descent deeply resented those in power. The end of the war boom saw unemployment, unrest, and strikes. The coalition clock will be out of working order soon, reported one national newspaper. Many Unionists returned to the Liberal Party. Thomas Creer found himself part of a government that believed in high tariffs. He resigned in protest and helped develop the new Progressive Party. Nine other Western members of the Parliament followed. The final nail in the coffin came with Borden's resignation in July 1920. Arthur Meehan became the new leader. His first action was to bury the Union government. During the 1921 election, Meehan campaigned under the name of the National Liberal and Conservative Party. It was an attempt to keep the support of the Liberals who had voted for the wartime Unionist government four years earlier. It failed. Meehan's government was swept away in an avalanche of public scorn, wrote one reporter on election night. The Union government survived four years. It was born out of a national crisis, and once that emergency ended, many saw little need for it. One contemporary historian wrote, the Union government left few monuments. Perhaps its one lasting legacy is that it still stands as the only coalition government in Canada's history.